Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to Pods of the Multiverse, Season 2. We are an unofficial D&D podcast. We play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. My name is Scala. I will be portraying the world, and with me are my three dear friends who will be playing the characters navigating that world, if you would. My name is Jeffy, and I play Illipel, the half-elf bullshit artist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. My name's Jimmy, and I play Clork, the is it engineer goblin. And my name is Andy, and I will be playing Alwyn, the Golgari scavenger. All right. Again, thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoy this show, uh, please engage with us. We're very friendly. Find us on Patreon, for those of you who don't listen to the end. Here for it. Um, And I'm told that rating and reviewing are also good for podcast metrics. So do do that stuff as well. And I'll babble no longer. And we'll begin our adventure in Ravnica. The city of guilds, a sprawling ecumenopolis where towering spires and glittering domes form a skyline that swallows the horizon. Here, ten factious guilds vie for power from the deepest bowels of the undercity to the sanctified apexes of cathedrals. This tale takes place in the city's tenth district, Ravnica's crown jewel, home to the symbol of tentative unity between the guilds, the chamber of the guild pact and the millennial platform that commemorates the pact's longevity. This is a center of commerce and industry, of faith and science, of cultural expression and exchange. Or it would be. Not two months ago, this beacon of Ravnica's excellence was brought low by a devastating invasion. A would-be dragon god from beyond the stars leading an army of skeletal warriors has left the tenth a ruined shadow of its former greatness. As the people of the city undertake the monumental task of rebuilding our lives, we begin our tale with... All right, who's going first? Oh, just like that. Do we have volunteers? <laughs> we should roll. Okay. I yeah. like that. I like, I that. like the roll off. Roll off. Ten. I ain't going first. I got a one. Six. I'm going first on a 10. Okay. Okay, we begin our tale with Illipel, the Violet Rose, an unassuming house of indulgence, but known by its discerning clientele for the high quality of its services. Here, amid the sweet smell of sweat mingled with perfumes, all manner of hedonists find a shadowed room to fulfill their debauched fantasies, or simply an escape from the pressures of city life. The proprietor of this establishment, recently certified as an advocate in the Church of Deals, is sitting in their office. Illipel, would you like to describe what you look like as you sit in your office? A half-elf of questionable character and questionable ends sits at a perfectly average height in their chair, boasting a perfectly average frame. Yet, in spite of this individual's unremarkable appearance, there is an undeniable gravitas to them. Illipel is, for all intents and purposes, usually the most important person in a room, or, at the very least, the one privy to the most secrets. Sporting a tan and cream-colored vest suit, Illipel is the definition of elegance and opulence. Their long, dirty blonde hair rests delicately on their shoulders, and in taking everything that Illipel has on display, you know instantly that you are standing in front of someone who believes one truth, that the ends will always justify the means. Mm. Very dubious. Philippelle, is there anything you're doing on this day as you sit in your office splendidly? I don't think, uh, let's see. Philippelle is probably doing some standard bookkeeping. All right. Perhaps considering what fragrances they will adorn themselves with, but really just focused on the bookkeeping at this point in time. Indeed. Philippelle pours over their ledgers. They maybe shoot an eye over to their cabinet of lush perfumes, and as they are doing this, they hear a knock on the door. Yes? The door creaks open, and uh, your maitre d' Remy pops his head in. Uh, Master Illipel, there's a gentleman to see you. More information, perhaps, you have? Well, he might be a colleague. I did inform him that you did not have any appointments for the day, but he was 
adamant that he be allowed to see you. What shall I tell him? This individual doesn't seem very forthcoming with information. <sighs> I'll go down to him. Do not let him up here. Go on, I'll follow you. As you say, and he shuts the door, and you can hear him scampering down the steps. I will close up and put in a locked drawer my, my ledgers, and I will choose a Le Artis Terra Rosa for today's fragrance. Mm. Oh my god. Very discerning. You spritz a little bit on yourself. Any other preparations you'd like to make? Ah, this one will do for today. I'll make my way downstairs and greet whoever this individual is. As you open the door, there does seem to be a gentleman standing outside, a young, square-jawed man with short brown hair. He's come up the stairs all on his own. He wears a pristine advocate's robe. It trails down to his knees above a fine pair of leather boots. He wears several long scroll tubes over his back and carries another bundle of official-looking documents under his arm. And standing behind him, its ears almost scraping the ceiling, a seven-foot-tall granite gargoyle imposingly folds its arms as the young man extends a business card to you. Good afternoon. My name is Tomek Vrona. I represent Viscopa Financial Services. Might I come in? I'm assuming you are the help. I gesture to the gargoyle, grab the card, and walk into my office. Come on. Taking your invitation, he strolls into your office. He takes the seat behind your desk and lays a scroll on it and gestures for you to sit. Please. Would you care to explain what we're doing here? Ah, uh, I am afraid, Master Illipel, I am here on some unfortunate business. He reaches into his bags, takes out an ink pot and a quill. I am here to discuss a regrettable breach of contract on your part. He makes a gesture to his gargoyle who closes the door behind the two of you. And such breaches of contract require whatever this individual is gesturing towards the gargoyle. My security comes with me everywhere I go. This is not uncommon. Illipel, you would know, as a member of the Orzhov Syndicate, that some higher-ranking individuals might have a gargoyle tend to them as a bodyguard, as both a status symbol and security. I am familiar with the benefits granted to you by your rank, but you do understand that the benefit I have as proprietor and owner of this establishment grants me the privilege to be somewhat skeptical of why this individual would need to sit in our company at present. But I will let it go. So, breach of contract, let us discuss. Yes, unfortunately... You were contracted to provide a service to my clients some six weeks ago, I believe you recall. So to be clear, you are referring to services that were not rendered on the day of our invasion. That is correct, but there is no clause exempting you due to extenuating circumstances in your <laughs> agreement. And as such, I must respectfully request that your advance fee be returned to my clients. You would be owing them 1,000 Xenos. Do you have this? As Tomek starts to talk about the advance fee that's due back, Illipel swats at that notion like a fly. Before we get into this uh, subject, I did try to inform Garavash that the extenuating circumstances went far beyond and predated the invasion. It is worth noting that... Oh boy, do I even tell you. What good will you do with this information? I am not here to listen to your excuses, Mr. Illipel. I am here to collect 1,000 Xenos. Or to establish payment options. Debt is a most odious of sins, Master Illipel. It would be wise of you to rid yourself of it. But a most delicate of opportunities, is it not? Hmm. Are you interested in a bargain, perhaps? Well, perhaps my, as you put it, excuse is a bargain in and of itself. No, that will not. I am quite certain that your handlers or Garavosh himself, would be keen to understand the exact reason why said meeting did not occur. My clients are not interested in why. My clients are interested in remuneration. But I can offer you bargain. On with it. Very good. I have a friend who is in need of someone with your talents, your connections. You perform a service for them. I move some numbers around. Your debt is erased. What would you say to this, Master Illipel? Allow me a counter-offer. I dutifully accept and perform and execute on this task that you have yet to divulge to me, and in return, you do not need 
absolve the entirety of my debt. I will allow you to receive 10% of the Violet Rose's profits up to a cap of 250 of those Zenos. What you do with those 250 is entirely between you and myself and this lovely specimen over here. The gargoyle does not acknowledge you. What I ask in return is for you to deliver a message for me. I am intrigued. What is the nature of this message? What you describe as an excuse for why my meeting did not occur, I view more as a revealing piece of information that pertains distinctly to the Orzhov Guild and the Golgari Swarm. This does not yet tell me the nature of the message or its recipient. I would like for you to send word to Garavash that the reason said meeting did not occur was not in fact because of my incompetence or inability to perform said task, or because of the recent invasion, but instead an agent of the Golgari Swarm, known as An Elgast, burned down the meeting location. Very well. Simple enough. Here. Sign and initial. You see he's been scrawling on a long sheet of paper this whole time. He presents you this legal document for your signature. Has he written on this document um, exactly to the letter what him and I agreed upon, or did he make any amendments to that? Make an insight check. 18. 18. Yes, this legal agreement seems to contain exactly what you specified. No sort of tricky fine print or anything like that that you can tell. Looks like you've written this down to the letter. Part of me is relieved, but I'll be honest with you, Chomek. Part of me is a little disappointed. Can't say I would have done the same. But I suppose that's what makes you better than me. And with that, my signature to you. And it'll all signs. Now, what of this task? Mm. He extends a hand to shake yours. Illipel shakes it delicately. You notice that Tomek's grasp is also not very firm. It's a very gentle handshake. We must bring you downtown to the Chamber of the Guild Pact. Come, no associate of mine is going to walk the streets like a filthy peasant. We take the Skyway. There's like a window in your room, yes? Yeah, it would be on the opposite side. It's like a loft area, and it would be on the opposite side of, like, the window shines light on my desk. He's going to open up the window. The gargoyle will step out, get on all fours, and spread its stone wings. He'll hop on, and he'll offer you to join him. This is an interesting way to get about the city. Tomek, you underestimate the denizenry of the Violet Rose. They are, after all, the reason I am able to pay you such a debt. Let's go. And I hop on. All right, cool. That's where we'll leave this scene. Uh, next in line is Clark. Clark, you are currently working in the coils. You're rather glad to be in here. It's winter, it's cold outside, but this network of pipes and wires and arcane conduits does have to it a warmth within as you make your way through this access shaft a medium creature might find it cramped but you can walk through here pretty easily would you like to describe your character clork sure clork is average height for a goblin he has a small paunch and his otherwise wiry frame his pointed ears and chin form a neat triangle around his weathered face expressive bushy eyebrows rest upon reflective work goggles he wears denim overalls, leather boots, and non-conductive rubber gloves, all bearing the insignia of the Izzet League. On his hip is a tool belt, heavy with devices both mundane and unusual. Every so often he stops to take his oversized wrench to one of the various machines down here. A bead of sweat forms on his bald green head and runs down his furrowed brow as he uses his body weight to manipulate the wrench. That might be standard size for a larger creature. Very cool. Yes, you go about tightening these connective bolts that hold these various tubes and wire clusters together. You're stopping at the various junctions and checking to see if they're still working. Power has been out in some parts of the city, and you've been tasked with restoring it. You come to a juncture, you open the, the fuse box, and it doesn't seem to be receiving power. These damn pyrokinetic resonators. I'm going to use Mendic. Great. You do. You use mending. Perhaps some frayed connections become whole. But even after you've done this, and the device should be in good working order, you don't see it light up. Go ahead and make an engineering check. Roll your tool proficiency plus intelligence. Sure. Fifteen. Okay, yeah. 
for sure you can f trace this to the source of the problem. You think that there might be some sort of larger structure above that is either broken somehow or turned off or something. You'd have to go check it out yourself, but it's somewhere on the surface. All right. Uh, I'm going to start looking for a hatch, the nearest one, to make my way up. Roll perception. That's not good. Six. That's okay. There are signs. This is a DC-5, we'll say. <laughs> you know there's an access hatch about 100 feet down. You get to it. You climb up to the surface with no difficulty. Your tools jangling on your belt as you open the hatch and you do feel the cold air under the gray sky sting you a bit as you've been in this warm subterranean access shaft. As you look around, you realize perhaps the issue. You're somewhere in the fourth precinct and the area around you has been completely demolished. No standing structure remains intact, just piles of rubble and crumbled flagstones. And whatever structure you're looking for was certainly most likely destroyed. Well, there's the issue. Uh, is there anyone nearby? Make a perception check. That's a 17 plus nothing. Yeah, you don't see anyone around. Hmm. At least, as far as you can tell, you can pretty easily find the broken substation. You head over towards it to investigate. Right. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a pile of broken parts. Looks like I need to put in for a replacement part. Yeah, this is probably going to take the rest of your week to get back up and running. Uh, it's a living. Does Clark begin to try and enact repairs on this? I could try to mend it again. You think there's some things you could do without going back to Nivix for parts. It's a bit of a hike from where you are. Yeah, and there's people back there I don't really want to see. So, mm. all right, I'll try some mending. Cool. Make me another engineering check. 13. Okay, good. You can, you know, start to fix the things you are able to fix. And as you do this for a little while, roll me one more perception check. 12. You still hear this because these people are not trying to hide from you at all. You hear someone call out in Goblin to you, Hey, what do you think you're doing? Oh, me? You turn and you see a pair of goblins with kilts and furs walking towards you. It looks like there's an older one and a younger one. They have a few trophies of claw or bone hanging off their garb, and their faces are painted with a chalky red war paint. The older one calls out, Yeah! Yo! Hey, we didn't break this stuff so somebody could come and fix it! Yeah, we broke it so it stayed broken! <laughs> Shut up! Your godfather's talking! <laughs> and yeah, these two goblins approach you. Well, you can't just go busting up all this stuff. This stuff belongs to the Is It League. You're gonna get yourself in trouble like that. Hey, listen, kid. This whole turf is rubble belt now. Nothing gets fixed. Things only get broke, okay? So why don't you, uh... Well, that's no way to live. I've been living this way for a long time. Look at me. I look all right, huh? Yeah, I look all right. Quiet, Pippo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> oh, please, man. Please excuse my godson. He doesn't. He doesn't have respect for his elders. Anyway... Look, what do they pay you, kid? 20 zips an hour? Yeah. 19, actually. Are your knees worth 19 zips to you? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Depends. How much are they paying you to bust up all our stuff? I ain't getting paid at all. This is what I do for fun. Why don't you just set down them tools, share a cigar with me and the boy, we'll take an hour, we can go our separate ways. Nobody's got to get hurt here. For fun? For fun? We got no time for fun. When you're born into the league, you work. You work and you work and you work until you die. All right? Now I got work to do. Get out of my way. You, you happy with that kind of life, kid? I'm happy with that life. My father was happy with that life. His father was happy with that life. I could go on. Are you happy living like a bum? <laughs> this is so fucking good. <laughs> Ravnica, directed by Marty Scorsese. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> He picks up his club and starts tapping his hand with it. Oh, you want to scrap? Scrapping's what I'm best at. I take off my gloves and roll up my sleeves. Why, yeah, you oughta. Okay, let's roll initiative if that's how it's going to be. <laughs> okay, that's nine. Okay. All right, Bapo's going first on a... No, shut up, that's not his name. Bapo and Bippo, the goblins. 
<laughs> the, the, the girl goblins. It's it worth noting that I, my parents called me Beppo growing up. Adorable. So don't know if one of these characters is inspired by me. A little baby Jeppy. Round one, top of the order. Bapo comes at you with a club. Does a 12 hit your AC? Just barely. Okay, Bapo's gonna bop. So you're gonna take eight points of bludgeoning damage. As he clubs you right in the knees. Da! Yeah. <laughs> you're up. All right, I am going to disengage. It's a bonus action. Very good. I'm gonna move away from him 30 feet. And I thought you wanted a scrap, huh? And I'm gonna let off a glitch bolt. Nice. Here's a little something I've been working on. All right, roll your attack. Seven. <laughs> oh no! That will not hit. Unfortunately, you shoot off your glitch bolt, but Bapo pretty easily sidesteps. I thought you worked all day. You gotta work a bit harder. <laughs> And then Bippo, <laughs> in the back, says, Yeah, you gotta work a bit harder! He pulls out a slingshot from under his wolf skin and uh, attempts to fire a sling bullet at you. Fucking thrilling dialogue. Uh, I assume a 10 does not hit you. Does not hit. The piece of errant rubble he's picked up from the ground and flung at you shoots over your head between your ears. Top of the order, it's back to Bapo. He's gonna run at you with the club. Oh, dear. Hey, uh-oh. Yes. Appear, what are you doing? I, I appear you to crit. have rolled a natural 20. Yeah, you did. Uh-huh. Papo's about to kill me. <laughs> this is like That's in the fun. RPG when you fight the main boss in the beginning. Bippo and Papo yeah. are the campaign this, this bosses. Is the, this is the asylum demon. You're fighting the yeah. asylum demon. Bippo and Papo are the final boss. As Bapo raises this club to stave your head in, you hear a massive crack of thunder and a bolt of lightning shoots down from the sky. Goes Bapo as he is struck by it and falls over, presumably dead? Hey, I got him. <laughs> Bippo says, Oh, Crocs, cheese it! Pointing to something behind you and scurries off into the ruins of this rubble belt. That once was the fourth precinct. And don't come back. Very well said, Mr. Clark. Don't come back. Who are you? You turn around. You see a human in a bespoke blue Magus' robe with red and gold accents. A bright red ascot is tied around his neck. His dark, slicked-back hair is accented with streaks of white, making him look older than he is. A set of contraptions hang on his back, his hip, and his forearm linked with copper tubing. The low hum of circuitry and the smell of ozone follow where he walks as errant arcs of electricity dance between his various devices. Quark probably might know who this is without making a check, but roll history for me just in case. Sure. Four. Ah. This is the new boss. You can't remember his name. Rob Zombie? Rax Allen? Uh, something like that? Oh, hey, Rick. <laughs> hey, hey, Clark! Hey, Clark! We gotta go. We gotta go through this tunnel. We gotta go through this wormhole. Come on! <laughs> it's Rao. That's all right, Mister Clark. Looks like I got to you just in time. Hmm. I could have taken those guys on my own. You didn't have to do anything. Nonetheless, I need you pretty much intact for something of an experiment. Pretty much. Come, walk and talk with me. You're getting a promotion. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Do you follow him? Yeah. He's my boss. Of course I follow him. Gotta do it for the easy league. Do anything he says. You follow your boss. So, there's a bit of a pilot program that I'd like you to, for lack of a better word, head up. Why me? You know Mizzix, right? Yeah, we met a few times. Why? Well, she remembers you. I asked her for a recommendation for someone whose competence went largely unnoticed, and uh, you are one of the names on the list. One of the ones still alive, at least. Clark has a look of surprise on his face, like he's surprised that someone so important would remember who he is. Yeah, of course she remembers me. <laughs> what does she want? Ah, uh, it's not what she wants, it's what I want. I have a hypothesis. 
and I'd like you to help me test it. You see, the crisis saw a hitherto for unforeseen level of cooperation between the various guilds, and I and some of my close confidence are eager to create a replication study, shall we say. You gonna kill niv Mizzet again? <laughs> no, not quite. But there is a complex problem that requires solving, and we should like to see if a diverse team of members from various guilds can work together to solve it. And I'd like you to be my control element for this experiment. Oh, you want me working with other guilds? Precisely, Mr. Clark. But they don't know anything about anything. Ral sort of laughs at this, nods his head. You know, I thought the same thing myself, but if you give them a chance, they might surprise you. I should like you to be an eminent individual of science on this, take copious notes, see where cooperation flourishes, where it breaks down. Treat this as a study. As you wish. Hey, how much does it pay, by the way? 25 zibs an hour. I told you you were getting a promotion. All right, Clark says as he rubs his knees. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so you look a little injured. He pulls out a viscous fluid in a vial from his robe and passes it over to you. As you come a drake at rest, this great blue lesser draconid sitting saddled. It's got various apparatus attached to it connected by copper tubing. After passing you this, he mounts up on the drake, puts on a helmet, and tosses you a goblin-sized helmet as he offers you a hand up. I get on. Cool. We go now to Alwyn. Alwyn, you have been staying the past few days in an inn in a no-man's land in the Undercity. This place serves as sort of neutral territory for the denizens of various guilds who make their homes down here. You being somewhat estranged from the swarm at present, you lie in a very simple room, rising early in the morning, even though the hours are hard to tell down below. Alwyn, would you like to describe your character? Sure. You would see... In this simple room, a young human man with side-buzzed but otherwise long blonde hair turned pale by the undercity stench. It's braided and woven with web and ivy. You see rune-carved stones adorning his Golgari leathers with a heavy, dark, green, almost black cloak that hides most of the rest of his person. You see he is eminently surrounded by spores like noxious thorns that can be seen also on his staff and twisted one-handed wooden hammer that he always carries at his side. Occasionally, you can see various satchels woven into his long tunic and kilt, including a poisoner's kit and a medicinal kit, which at this point he's probably working on refilling or repacking. Excellent. Alwyn is checking his stock of various herbs getting ready for what might lie ahead. I assume at some point you leave this room and go above? Sure. Okay, cool. You exit this room into sort of a dank hallway. You climb up a small set of stone steps into the common area of this inn, the wilted petal. You nose in it the familiar scent of damp soil and moss, mingled with garlic, rosemary, and thyme. Several simple wooden tables and benches are scattered about the stone floor of this bar room, where a motley collection of patrons of all races mill about with bowls of soup and mugs of coffee, tea, or bitter stout, perhaps muttering in dim conversation. Alwyn, what do you do? The first thing I suppose I would do after leaving my quarters is give a quick scan of the room to see if there's anybody I would recognize that I would perhaps want to steer clear of. Okay, go ahead and make a perception check. Okay. It's going to be a 15. Again, you see various types of people, but no one who stands out to you. You see other humans, some Devkaran elves, as well as some uh, Vyashinu, some goblins, even even some, even like the odd, perhaps, vampire or demon. Okay. Seeing no one necessarily that I would want to avoid in my current condition, I'll head up to the bar and say... A black tea, if you have any. Uh, the woman behind the bar greets you, and an older elven woman. Oh, of course, uh, darling. Um, would you like anything to eat? We've got mushroom stew, mushrooms on toast. We've got some bacon. Well, it's dried mushrooms, but 
it's uh, prepared in a way to make it almost taste like bacon. No, thank you. But since you asked, if you have any wormwood or king's foil, I'm looking to resupply. I'll have to check in the back, but we might have something like that. Are you going to want the room for another night, hon? That'll be 50 zibs. I can maybe throw in some of what I got spare as part of the deal. Can I check, like, my... my... Can I check my starting money and see if I'm going to be able to afford that? Sure. She's asking for half a gold piece. Okay. Yes, thank you. Another night for now. Very good. She heads in back. She does bring you your tea and and one small bundle of the herbs you were looking for. Probably good for at least a dose each for your kits. Okay, great. Then I will simply sit in a otherwise unoccupied corner of this establishment and drink alone. As she hands you your tea, she will say, You looking for any work, hon? Just kind of looking back stoically, I go to raise my hood up and say simply, Maybe another time. Well, if you change your mind, that Vaishinu chap in the corner said he was looking for somebody to help him find something lost. And I'm sure he can find someone else. Lots of lost things and lots of people looking down here. Okay. You take your tea and you go to the corner to drink it. As you're drinking your tea, a Vyashinu chap walks towards you. I thought as much. <laughs> um, Remind me what those are again? Vyashinu are like lizard folk. Okay, cool. His scales are a dull metallic color like copper or bronze. His long claws and hunched posture suggest his advanced years. He uses a walking stick that sort of has the head formed in the shape of a power coil. He is wearing a bright red and blue is it jumpsuit strapped with an assortment of small laboratory tools and measures. Over one eye is affixed a large lens with several smaller lenses that could slide into place to offer different levels of magnification. And he sits next to you and says, Ah, good morning, my friend. From beneath my dark hood, as I sort of blow gently on this tea, clasped in both of my hands, I say back, And how would you know that? It's always dark down here. Ah, well, uh, well... He rolls up his sleeve. There's like a number of different instruments hanging on his arm. He points to one that's a clock. Ah, I can still keep the time. Just kind of exhaling to myself, I just go, That's not what I meant. Uh, I have, however, lost my pocket watch, and it's uh, of rather sentimental value to me. I, I don't suppose you could help me recover a lost curio. Nell said that you were adept at that sort of thing. You shall be generously compensated for your efforts. I'm currently not looking to make any trouble in the Undercity whatsoever. If you lost this watch of yours anywhere within the Swarm's territory, I won't do it. Oh, what harm could come from helping an old man find his watch? <laughs> Clearly you haven't spent a lot of time down in the Undercity, have you? Uh, he sort of tilts his head. Ah, I've spent more time probably doing everything there is to do than you've spent doing anything at all. And so why is it you need someone like me to look for this thing, then? Well, he sort of taps his big lens. My eyes aren't what they used to be. And you look like you've got young eyes. Capable eyes. And you know, he sort of leans in close. I might have a lead on some work above if you're looking to get out from under here. I gaze deeper into my tea at that notion. Can I make a insight check? Absolutely you can. Because those are words I would be interested in. Insight, that is going to be a 22. This old Vyashinu is absolutely telling you the truth. He may have work above for you if you can do this thing for him. All right, then. If you're one of your word, let me finish my drink and we can continue. He claps excitedly. Excellent! It shall be a minion's trial. Uh, 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 a job interview. Excuse me. That's, that's what they say. As long as it'll get me farther away from here. Yes, I think it shall do precisely that. I shall wait outside for you to finish your beverage. And he excuses himself from your table, his cane clacking along the stone floor. Can I just see if anybody may have been... Can I see if anybody was uh, watching that conversation? Yeah, sure. I would say roll perception or insight. Okay. Only a 14. Doesn't appear to you as if anyone was observing your conversation. Okay. I'll finish my drink, keeping my hood up, and and I will make my way outside. 
You can do all of that. You meet the Vyashinu. He says, Oh, my most sincere apologies. It occurs to me that I did not even have the presence of mind to introduce myself to you. My name is Vim. Vim the Vigorous. Well, they called me that in my salad days, but no longer, I assume. And what is your name, young master? You can call me Green Wolf. Ah, uh, very good, Green Wolf. Uh, I believe I dropped my watch somewhere along that passageway. And he points down one of the dank tunnels of the Undercity. And where am I to find you, Vim, when I find this item of yours? Oh, I shall accompany you. Very well. Just, like, looking him up and down, does he look ready to travel? <laughs> Make an investigation check. That's only going to be a ten. He looks like he's pretty well equipped. He does have a lot of different devices on him. It's hard to tell, but you think he might be a mage of some sort mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by the various things hanging off his jumpsuit. All right then, Vim. Watch your step. I'll lead the way. Indubitably, Master Greenwolf. As you try and follow this Vaishinu's trail, make me a survival check. As we set off, it's a given that it's dark, right? Beyond any structures? Yeah. Immediately outside the tavern, there'd be a, a torch, but beyond that... Then beyond that, it's it's all dark. Okay, right. Then in that case, as we set off, before I make this check, I'm going to go ahead and cast Dancing Lights. Excellent. And you will see from my quarterstaff these small, almost will-o'-wisp-like lights. A shade of seafoam green begin fluttering around. And I'll go ahead and make that roll. Splendid cantrip. Good technique. Uh, ignoring his compliment, that's a 16. Very good. Yes, easily you're able to pick up where two clawed reptilian footprints are accompanied by the depression of a walking stick. You follow his pathway through this wending, winding tunnel for a ways, and... How long ago did you pass through here? Well, uh... I've made this trek a couple of times. I'm not sure exactly when I lost the object, but most recently, I suppose, I came down here this morning, not really an hour ago. As he's talking, I'm falling into full work scavenger mode. Mm -hmm. And so I'm following along the ground here as he's talking, and, and where are we coming from? Ah, um, uh, from, a, from a metallurgical shop down in the 6th. Can I roll insight on that as well? Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> insight and perception are by far my highest stats for rolling, and saying that, that's a 23. He's lying through his teeth. I'm going to try and show no hint of me being onto this at all. Okay. And what is it that brings you down here so often that you would keep this path? I'm just, uh, well, as I said, there's some work above, and I'm looking for some capable individuals to perhaps assist me with it. Knowing that there's obviously something very jarring that he hasn't yet revealed to me, I will just sort of stop along this path, still looking at the ground, looking at the tracks and everything, but just stop. Okay. Is something wrong, Master Greenwolf? Is there danger? There might be. I grip my mallet tightly in one hand, and without turning back to look at him, I say... It's just you and me out here in this path. You're going to tell me the real story, and so help me. If this involves Idric, I won't have it, and you'll never see me again. He flips a few of his lenses in front of his eye and kind of looks at you closely. I don't know an Idric, but your astuteness is admirable. I knew I had found a clever one in you. No, very well. I suppose I shall give you some of the veritable truth. I work for the Office of the Guild Pact. My grip loosens a little bit, and I say, Go on, then. We have also lost track of uh, an object of some value, and someone who is adept at finding things in unlikely places might be useful in its recovery. Well, Vim, you half-truths have gotten you this far. As long as your business gets me out of the Undercity, then I won't be beating you over the head with my hammer for lying to me. Oh, that would be a riveting experiment. But nevertheless, if you can find my watch, I guarantee you, you shall be swiftly conveyed away from this place. Very well. And I continue along this trail. All right. Make me one more perception check. You can do this with advantage. Okay. 
Well, that's a nat 1 on the first dice, but a 19 plus 6 on the second. Beautiful. You are able to find somewhere amid the mud and sludge of this sluiceway the glint of a metal chain on the end of something. Stay here. You never know what could be hiding in the mud. And I approach. You approach? Do you pick the item up? I'm going to give a closer look as I can at it and whatever it's sort of lodged in. It's lodged in some muck, let's say, without getting too descriptive. Sure. Can I maybe make a nature check or something to see if I would know that it would be relatively safe to just grab it? Sure. Go ahead and roll that. That's a 14. It's probably safe for what passes for whatever goes through the sewer. Just cover your nose, you know? Okay. Yeah, then I'll pick it up. You do. You can see on the end of this chain, there's a chitinous ball, almost like the uh, shell of a beetle formed into this locket. Mm. And as Vim sees you pick it up, you can hear the squelch of his cane as he approaches behind you and he says, Excellent, excellent minions trial concluded. Job, job interview concluded. I shall send you to join my other minions, uh, employees. And you hear the hum of electricity. You with the slight smell of ozone, and you see a bit of crackling spark as he lays a hand upon you, and you vanish. I see what you did there. I see what you fucking did there. (laughs) I maybe did the exact same thing you did to me. (laughs) All right. I'll actually do this narration for both Illipel and Clork, because you both have sort of a similar experience flying in downtown. You glide through the skyway between steeples and spires, one of you on a drake, the other on a gargoyle. You fly towards the wealthy first precinct. Here, much of the city has been repaired and the spires and rooftops already gleam with a light dusting of snow as you pass over them. You can see other riders commuting through the air, directed along their route by a handful of angels or Liev Griffin riders. And after a few minutes, you see the domed roof of the Chamber of the Guild Pact. Your Mount descends towards the dome, swoops into one of the many open archways near its peak, and you land in something of a rookery where a number of other flying beasts are tethered. Illipel, you would arrive here first, and Tomek leads you down a spiral staircase into a huge central chamber, the stone floor displaying a mosaic with each guild's symbol forming a ring around the stylized silhouette of a dragon. The walls form arches, framing ten stained glass windows depicting storied moments in each guild's history, and featured in the center of this chamber is a crystal monument depicting one dragon stabbing another with a two-pronged spear. Fucking sick. Tomek, I can't help but feel like I'm a rat brought just now to the center of its maze. Are you here to greet me? With the scientists that plot every move, this doesn't bode well for me. Mm. Illipel, you are a rat with no cheese. Chase after the cheese. And as you are having this conversation, it's interrupted by a call. Tommy, good to see you. As Ral and Clork step into this scene. Wow, they didn't waste any time redecorating this place. I know, quite something, isn't it? Tomek gives a slight declension of his head. Guild Mr. Zerik. It is good to see you as well. I have delivered a capable agent as your request. Oh, me? <laughs> That's great. That's so good. <laughs> yes, you. Certainly not me. After all, I'm a rat chasing after a ball of cheese. Is that right, Tomek? You are getting pictured very quickly. I have other matters to attend to. Mr. Zerk, if you'll excuse me. I'll see you later, Tommy. I should hope so. And he leaves and goes back to the rookery. Tommy. As you are having this conversation, bzzz, there's a crackling of power and a bewildered Alwyn shows up next to you. My hood would still be up. Generally, at all times, I'm traveling cloaked. Mm-hmm. So you would simply see someone in heavy Golgari leathers. Interestingly enough, you are still clutching the locket in your hand. Oh, okay. What's that smell? <laughs> I don't even know how to respond. I, like, I, I, as a player, nor a character, do I even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know either. Just, Clark is already a treasure. Uh, Alwyn, are you going to take that? Uh, I 
stand unmoving. I kind of put my arm down that's holding the locket. I was sent by Vim. Who's in charge? Uh, That would be me for the time being. But after I leave, I am a very busy individual. I'm going to have to say uh, you should report to Clark here. Is this guy the new Is It Guildmaster? Yes, this is the Guildmaster. Would I know that? Roll history. Okay. You might not, because he is... Right. Yeah. Like, I, I figured pretty much everybody's going to know who all the Guildmasters are, but since this was this kind of new... This guy's kind of new, yeah. yeah. Yep. History. That's a 17 with no mod. Yeah, you know exactly who he is. I assume I do on the same roll. Yes, you okay. do. You both do. You both know his name better than Clark, who works for him. <laughs> Forgive me, Guildmaster. Very well. All right. As I said, very busy. Don't have much time. Let's walk and talk. I'll show you the problem that I need you all to solve. Uh, And he leads you down another set of wider spiraling stairs into sort of the underbelly of this cylindrical chamber as he begins to explain to you why you are here. Last night, an object that me and my research team were prodding at a bit went missing. We'd like the three of you to recover it. I'll take you now to take a look at the crime scene. Do you tend to tell us what this object was? It was a sun disk with very unique magical properties. Would any of us know what that is? Do I know what that is? (laughs) All of you can roll Arcana or History. 22. 7. A flat 16. This has kind of been kept under wraps, but Illipel may have heard a rumor of a sun disk that was used as either a weapon or some sort of barrier by the invading army. You seem like the type to have an admiration, respect for empirical evidence and data-driven decision-making. Who are you saying this to? Killed Master. Okay, great. <laughs> I was just making sure it wasn't me, because I that's fucking no. not. <laughs> You're eminently correct, uh, Master... It's Illipel. Shocking you didn't know that, considering you've summoned the three of us here. No matter, I respect your approach and find your choices inspired. But, that being said, one has to wonder what evidence led you to choose the three of us for such an endeavor as involving our city's defense. A riveting question, Master Illipel. I will put it to you this way. The Draco genius, uh, the Firemind, uh, the Living Guild Pact, need only speak the words and they become law. If this could be returned by application of the law, it would already be back in our possession. There is something else at work here, and that is why we need to work outside of normal channels. Wait a minute. Ew, Bill. I slowly take my hood down. I recognize that name. I'm almost offended it took you this long. You. I remember you from the war. You were one of the refugees. We hid in Stonehaven. In my mother's house. And you, an inspiring druid. I just give a stoic nod. Ah, you hear from about waist high. (laughs) Can we get on with this? My apologies. Raul tries to throw you, Clark, a grin and a wink like, See, it's working. They're working together. And then you are led into this laboratory-looking space. There's a pedestal in the middle and various instruments and measures aimed at it as if they were taking readings. Outside the door, you notice that there is an angel standing guard. Literal angel. (laughs) A literal angel standing guard. She's wearing a breastplate with the sort of characteristic Boros emblem of the fire fist. She was holding a spear in front of the door, but she moves it aside to let you pass and enter. We had to heighten security a bit after the incident. So, uh, this is where the thing went missing. I suppose if you can't gather any more leads from here, the best thing to do would be to... Talk to the guards who were on duty that night. Have you any more questions for me before I leave you to it? Is there anything you're not telling us? He smiles at you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. It's Alwyn. Alwyn. Alwyn Greenwolf. Alwyn Greenwolf. If I were to tell you everything I knew that potentially you didn't, we would be here longer than I have time for. So. Good one. Is there going to be like a little high five here? I thought of it, but I didn't. Yeah. 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 He high fives you. (laughs) Do you have a specific question that I might answer for you? I kind of fall back into my investigatory scavenger mode. Do you have any indication as to an enemy or a interested party in this item? 
I have several working theories, but none I am confident enough to throw a lightning bolt at, so to speak. I just look towards Illipel and Clark as he says this. Then in lieu of theories, one does wonder. You are certainly someone who has a keen respect for time. And after all, the faster we go about our business, the faster you can get back to your experiments and work that has to be done. Might there be some upfront capital you'd be willing to grant us in the pursuit of, say, expediting such a task? You'll receive compensation from the Office of the Guild Pact at the end of the week. I'm sort of doing a favor for a friend here. I don't really have the authorization to talk about your pay and benefits and things of that nature. Oh, important detail that you should be privy to. The wards around the room and the pedestal were intact when we arrived this morning. So, whoever took it likely had some way of bypassing these wards. Also, the disc is large. Seven, eight feet in diameter. Uh, we believe it may have been taken out via an extra-dimensional space. Yeah, so a, a typical sun disc. Yeah, of course. We all know what that is, right? Say no more. <laughs> all right, well, I think we can take it from here. Thanks, Randy. We'll see you around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh. Randy, Randy, <laughs> Randy nods at you, Clark. I have one more question, if you'll excuse me, Guildmaster. Please. How long have you had it? Six weeks. And it was found right after the attack? Yes. Very well. You hear a crackling of electricity, you nose a bit of ozone, and with a flash, he's gone. And the three of you are standing in this lab. All right, let's get to it then. Cloak, was it? That's right. Don't forget it. <laughs> Got the look of a... Is it League worker? What gave it away? Looking at Clark, I just go on saying, Is there anything more you can tell us about what this thing is supposed to do? A sun disk? Uh, it'd take too long for me to explain it. We'll pick it up on the way. Well, the way starts here, so why don't you start? Well, for, uh, <laughs> to save some time, how about you first tell me what you know about it? <laughs> do you know absolutely nothing, do you? Hey, what's his name? Put me in charge. So keep your little remarks to yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, these guys. Oh, man. <laughs> Trying to look like I'm ignoring that. I turn towards the pedestal and give it a look over. Sure, make an investigation check. Not great at that. That's only a 13. It's a stone cylinder, maybe about four feet high. There appear to be some markings etched into it, some sort of arcano-mathematical, alchemical equations etched into it. What'd you find? <sighs> There's too much damn maths for my expertise. I shrug and step away. Why don't you have a look at it? All right. You said there were a lot of like different instruments pointed at where the thing presumably went missing. Uh, do they look like they're usually there, or do they look like they are there trying to figure out where it went? Make me an engineering check. 16. You think that these were part of the normal sort of setup of this lab. You've seen this before when they're trying to study something with unknown magical properties. Okay. As I step away, can I begin casting a ritual spell? Absolutely. What are you casting? I'm going to start casting Detect Magic, just with the intent to give the entire room just kind of a base preliminary look about cool whether at the instruments or the pedestal or anything else are either of the two of you doing anything in the 10 minutes that this is taking place i do two things but first to clark what is the nature of these instruments above oh well you got your uh here it comes your anti-magnetic deflector panel hyperharmonic catalyzer halogenic spectrum emitter <laughs> phase polarity console you know just the typical lab stuff and what does it do? Oh, you mean they don't teach you this stuff in school? I was homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. There are guards in the room, correct? There's one angel standing outside the door. Yeah, I'd like to walk up to the door and ask her a question. Yes, citizen? Can I help you? Ah, oh, you are a lovely seraph. I had a question for you, however. Good word. I am keen to understand... Where might be the guards that were on duty last night? Roll persuasion. Okay. Dirty 20. Those details were not given to me, citizen. However, if you were to ask at the garrison, the corporal on duty may be able to tell you. Thank you. 
You are most welcome, citizen. Walking back to Clerk, we'll see how this pans out. Surely, with our good friend here, it will be most fruitful. But in the event it's not, we should make way for the garrison after this. Sounds like a plan. All right. Alwyn, you finish casting your detect magic ritual. As I finish my druidic incantation completing the ritual, you see the small spores about my form burst out into a thinly veiled aura of glowing, dust-like green entities. And they sort of hover and float and dance about in the air as I look about with my eyes flaring a similar green shade. Excellent. These green motes concentrate on the magical objects and effects in the room. What comes to your vision first is a strong abjuration aura on the pedestal itself. Uh, On some of the instruments you see various auras. Probably the most prevalent would be those of divination magic. As you look around the room, make me a perception check. It's going to be a 21. Excellent. You also catch in this room, sort of clinging to the wall, a very faint aura of transmutation magic. And it's not the whole wall. It's like there are some spots on the wall, little splotches. I'll approach. There's something here on the wall. Yes, you approach the wall. And as you get closer, you can see this aura is coming from something of a stain or a thin layer of gelatinous residue that seems to be clinging to the walls. Can I try and maybe scrape some of it off into a vial or something? Yeah, sure. You can do that. I do that first. And then, turning to the others, transmutation, and it's not part of what was already here. Well, that's a good start. One wonders what form they had tried to take. Form, Master Illipel. I've heard stories of things taken out of the Undercity without anyone even touching them. Can I try and make, like, a nature check or something on this residue? Absolutely. And if either of the two of you would like to make any checks at all, I'll entertain all comers. I guess I would do like a history check to see and remember like if any guilds or groups of peoples are known for dabbling in transmutation magic. Okay, yeah, sure. 14. I mean, Elifel, you would know that mages are very common across the city. Perhaps the most prevalent practitioners of transmutation would likely be the Demir or the Simic though they use it for different reasons. Mm. Uh, The Selesnia as well would use transmutation. They're also well known for having druids and things of that nature. But there's also, you know, guildless mages out there who can use transmutation. I've got a dirty 20 nature. Whatever this residue is, it seems both magical and organic. Mm. One does remember transmutation to be quite popular among the Dimir and other guilds, but none... A motive that makes entirely too much sense to me. Green Wolf, you prefer? It's just an alias. Alwyn it is, then. When you've encountered this before, you and your fellow swarm, who were the culprits? I mean, I was just making up that I knew stories. Um, would there be any stories? Hmm. Okay. Your mother would have probably told you some stories about some fights that she had with the Selesnia, Mm. who she had something of a rivalry with, and they use in their ranks all manner of trained magical beasts. Some of them have been known to train giant spiders that might be able to produce something like this. Mm. But again, there's a broad spectrum of possibilities here. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, sure the Dimir have a name for stealing what's not theirs. But Selesnia, and I kind of look to the ground with an intense look of bitterness. Selesnia Simic. They're known to take things that the Golgari know just to leave alone. While I do respect your point of view, and quite frankly understand it, I would argue that we may not have enough evidence as of yet to pursue down that course. And I do think these threads to be a bit thin. That being said, I do have a potential lead, and not too far. We should make way for the barracks, unless you, gesturing to clerk, have some other thoughts, or have gleaned any information sitting in this room. No, you two already said everything I was going to say, so I uh, think we can make our way to the garrison. All right then, Ilupel, let's have it. Lead the way. I'm no leader. 
I would hate to step on your toes. Good sir. Was it Clork? You know it was. <laughs> wow. Does he sort of spin his wrench around like a revolver? <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Finger guns. <laughs> yeah. You know the way to the barracks? Yeah, sure. Then by all means. All right. I walk out the door and start furiously looking for signs. <laughs> You head out the door, you head up the stairs that you came into the magnificent central chamber where all sorts of people are milling around. This is a busy spot for people to discuss political affairs. It's an interesting route you have chosen to take. I surmise that probably a stroke of genius to be milling about such parts we may in fact glean more information. You truly are an inspiring leader, Clark. Yeah, thanks. Wow, this guy really knows how to talk. So, Clark, as you try to find your way to the Boros garrison, roll me... I kind of want to say straight intelligence, but history also seems like it would suffice here. Thirteen. Yeah, this is a difficult place to find. You sort of look around confused for a moment, but then you do see an archway leading out under the large stained glass arch depicting legions of angels and ranks of foot soldiers in battle. You sort of find a path that you presume leads to the garrison. Right this way. As we step outside, I'm going to put my hood back up. Yeah, it is rather cold. The sky is still gray. You step outside onto a fairly wide bridge that leads over a pretty large fountain pond that lies beneath this chamber. You stride out onto the streets, and you can see, about a block or so away, an emblem of the fire fist sort of raised in the air. You walk through the streets, you get to the entrance, there's a couple of guards standing at the door, and behind them are some posters. There's one with an angel pointing directly at the viewer, saying, Aurelia wants you, nearest recruitment station. (laughs) And there's another one sort of on the opposite side of this gateway that depicts a dark-haired, buff Mediterranean guy riding a pegasus, swinging like a black longsword over his head. The text of it simply says, Ravnica needs heroes. Enlist today. Legion propaganda. And the guards notice your approach unless you're attempting to be stealthy or something. I walk right up. Ah, hello! My good citizens, have you come to enlist in the Boros Legion, the greatest and strongest guild in Ravnica? Yeah, no, no. Uh, we're here on the orders of, uh, uh, uh... Well, with the guild pact, office business. I see. Are you sure you don't want to enlist, young sir? You look like you have a fire for combat in your eyes. We'll arm you, we'll train you, we'll pay you well. I've already got arms. I've already got pay. And while we would be most grateful to serve in the proud tradition of such a glorious fighting force, sadly we are here on much more urgent matters on behalf of the Guild Pact. What they said. Very well. What is the nature of your matter, then? We are looking for two guards, as of yet unnamed, though I do hope and trust you can help us in such that matter. We're two guards. We're unnamed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> fuck right off with that great and hopefully they are you by any chance were the two of you serving as guard posts for the guild pack last evening no that was not us we're day shift guys right now we're on the day shift that's us ha <laughs> precisely all right that's enough of this we need to talk to a commander yeah the corporal will be in her office i can point you the way wait wait how do we know these guys are really with the guild pack yeah yeah that's a That's a good question. That is a good question. I mean, wait. (laughs) This was a logic critical hit against (laughs) Clork. I still have that pocket watch, right? Yes, you do. I show it to them. Sure, you show them this chitinous pocket watch, and they sort of take a look at it. Uh, Is there something inside it? This was given to me by an officer of the Guild Pact. I don't know if we can verify that, though. Do you mind if I take a look inside? I just stare at them blankly. (laughs) Okay, one of them's going to reach for it and pop it open. Okay. And as they do, a little metal badge sort of falls out and clatters on the ground. Like I said, this was given to us by an officer. There's our badge. The legionnaire guard sort of kneels down, picks it up, takes a look at it. Well, looks like a fair enough credential to me. Hands it back to you. Thank you. Corporal will be in our office. It's right in the back behind the mess. And they let you pass. All right. We go in. You walk through like a open air sparring field. 
there aren't many soldiers out here today. It's still fairly chilly, not the greatest day for training. And you walk into the garrison, and you see there's this sort of imposing, very blocky, constructed building with the symbol of the Fire Fist shooting proudly into the air on banners above. It looms down at you as you pass through its gates. You walk inside, it's the same very matter-of-fact sort of block construction with similar banners and regalia hung on the walls, as well as some ornamental weapons. You can find the corporal's office easily enough, and as you step in, you see a Loxodon woman sitting at a desk with a map and several sheaves of paper. She wrinkles her long trunk up as you enter and says, Yes, can I help you? I look to Clark from below my hood. As do I. She doesn't see Clark. Yeah. <laughs> she peers down, leaning over. Her trunk droops over the end of her table that she's got in front of her. She now looks at you, Clark. Everyone seems to be expecting you to say something. Yeah. We're here on business of the Office of the Guild Pact. We need the names of two gods who were on duty the other night. We're hoping you can help us out. Uh, yes, I... I would. She reaches into her desk and pulls out a leather-bound register, and she thumps it onto the table. Ah, uh, yes, I have the duty roster from last night. What assignment specifically are you looking for? Well, that's classified. Well, if it's classified, I can't tell you. It isn't. We are looking for two guards that were on duty last night inside the Guild Pact, specifically guarding the Centimost Lab. Oh, uh, yes, that unit. Yes, I can give you their names. There were four of them, not two. I don't know where you got that notion. <laughs> uh, let's see, that would be Sergeant Zoltan's unit. With him would have been Vinnick, Zepp, and Martin. All right. And uh, what can you tell us about these guys? Well, some people were quite unhappy with their inability to perform their task. Last evening, we had to send some angels in to cover for them. So they have been put on a rather undesirable patrol route today. I see. She pushes the roster aside and shows you the map. She indicates a section of blocks in the 4th Precinct. They've been given patrol duty in the... What the Gruel would have you think is the new rubble belt. We'll clear them out quickly enough. Those four, they can't handle a cushy post guarding diplomats and their trinkets. Well, then they'd best remember how real soldiering is done. Rubble belt, you say? You won't hear me say it, but it is rubble for the time being. I could not agree more. A split-off hybrid of clans, always eager to start such ill tidings and fisticuffs. I sympathize with you, Corporal. That being said, we do have urgent matters to attend to with Zoltan and his guard, and I hope you do not mind us too much going over and paying them a visit in the middle of their shift. No, no, not at all. I just hope you get to them before a giant does, or something bigger. Under the fearless direction of my good friend, Clark here, I suspect we will have no such trouble. That's right. I see him try to start trouble. <laughs> all right. You've been a lot of help. Let's go. What would be bigger than a giant out there? Well, the Cyclopses, the giants among giants, Ettins, two giants stapled together, and then there are the bigger things. Have you heard any sightings of them recently? What do you think turned that whole area into nothing but shattered cobblestones and bricks? The army of the dead. Not up that way. That way it was the Gruul themselves took advantage of us dealing with that immediate problem and decided to turn a whole precinct into part of their sick devotion to ruins and... Returning to nature. Yeah, can't stand those guys always smashing up the machines. They don't even know what the machines do. They smash them anyway. I mean, like, come on. Their <laughs> zeal for destruction almost parallels our zeal for justice. If you'll forgive my ideological bent there. Ideological bent aside, though I am <laughs> known to wax philosophical from time to time myself, one might hope that we have the ability to make some change in Precinct 4 on our journey. That being said, I think we should be off. All right. If you come across something big out there, I hope you've got more action to go along with all of your words. You know, size doesn't matter that much, Clark says as he leaves. The older elephant woman looks at you, and she gives, like, an acknowledging nod. She acknowledges that as you depart, and you head back out onto the street. Leaving. I just kind of say to Illipel, if she didn't bring it up, I was gonna. You're one to talk yourself. In circles, Ilpel. 
I can at least respect the gruel for their actions, if not for their convictions. What do you have to show for yours? Well, truthfully, not very much. And I suppose that's what makes me question my place here. I believe I stand among superiors. Quite shocking, you'd imagine, that I'd be chosen for this task. That being said, while words are mostly wind, on occasion they do have an ability to inspire. Do you not recall? You needn't remind me. That walking dare to put us in the ground if it weren't for you. I understand your trepidation in accepting me as part of your pack. But please know that I will continue to do what I can. And while my convictions may appear to waver, I will continue to try and earn your trust. And am perfectly content to accept the fact that it may take time. I have a distinct feeling with our more than capable friend at the helm. We may have a bit of time together. Can you pick up the pace a little? To it. I say nothing to retort to that, and I simply follow Clark. I would also, if I may, like to make a perception check as we sit out. Sure, sure. is there something specific you're looking for? The uh, prying eyes. Okay. That's only a ten. You see the city, blanketed in light snowfall. You see people going about their day. Pack animals walking through the streets. All sorts of people of various walks of life, though in this district... Most of them better dressed than you're accustomed to. Squint my eyes at the glare and say, It might be pretty, but if anything, the snow just makes it harder to see up here. All right, you're downtown. Uh, You got to get uptown. How are you doing that? How do you get around this city? Is there anything like a cab we can hail? Some sort of, perhaps, mount we can hire? Yeah, there would probably be some vehicles that you could be able to ride, make the journey a little quicker. All right, I'm going to try to find one of those. Okay, roll... I think perception or investigation is suitable for this. It's an at 20, plus 3. Well, hot Dang. damn. Uh, you see, sitting across the street... <laughs> One magically appears. And there's a person outside holding a sign with our names on it on a net. <laughs> <laughs> you see a very sleek-looking carriage. It's drawn by a team of four elk. Cool. The embellishment along the side has the intricate roots and branches symbol of the Selesnia Conclave, boasting of the animal's good breeding. And there is a coachman sort of standing idly beside it. All right, I'm going to approach him. Good morning, Master... Call me Clork. Master Clork, would you like to engage my services to uh, travel uh, throughout the city? I would. We're working on behalf of the Office of the Guild Pact, so... A very prestigious pursuit indeed. I should be happy to accept the custom of such honorable persons in my carriage. Glad to hear it. All right, hop in, guys. To where would I be taking you? Going to the fourth. That is rather dangerous at the moment. Then you understand the nature of our work. Indeed I do, but these dear elk are quite expensive. I do not know if I would feel comfortable risking them even for your illustrious band. I could get you as far as Sunhome. Sunholm? I don't know. It is the last safe place in that area, unless you should like to go to Nivix. Nivix is in the fort, right? Yes, it is. It's sort of, so like on the southern edge is Sunholm, and sort of on the western edge is Nivix. From the map we were shown, do we have an idea of which one might be closer to where we're trying to get to? This is somewhere in the northwest part, so you think Nivix might actually be closer. Nivix, perfect. Ah, uh, very good. I shall take you that far. It will be something of a longer route. Some of my fellow guildmates are still mourning our great home tree where she fell in the central plaza, so we will have to travel around that. Ah, yeah. Special tree, was it? The coachman sort of looks solemnly at the ground. Yes, many of us lived our whole lives within its boughs. I plan to go later today and pay my respects when my shift is concluded. I would remember the name of the tree, right? Everyone would probably know this. It is Vitugazi. From beneath my cloak, I just put a hand on the coachman's shoulder and say, Sorrow not, the great Vitugazi has returned to the earth. She fought bravely and defended all of Ravnica. Death is not the end of the cycle of nature. I trust you know that. He looks at you. Surprised appreciation is the look that sort of greets you back. Her seeds and saplings carry new life and her memory, but such a great voice in the song of Mat Selesnia to be lost, it is a deep tragedy. (sighs) Forgive me, 
Let us get you to your destination. There are, like, windows in this carriage, right? Yeah, there would be. Yeah, I'm just kind of glancing out on the ride. So you make your way to the west and then to the north. You head down Tin Street on your way towards Nivix. And after 45 minutes of a swift canter through the city, you arrive at your destination. The coachman opens the door and would ask for two Zenos payment for the journey. Are we at Nivix? You're at Nivix. Is there anyone around? You're right at the entrance. Yes, there are people coming and going to this large spire crackling with power, both electrical and arcane. But I would say there isn't anyone you immediately recognize. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks for the ride. Just charge it to the Izzet League. Guy by the name of Raoul, I think? I do not accept credit, I'm afraid. My good sir, for your wonderful services here. In fact, one extra, just for you. I hand him three. All right, you hand him three gold pieces, and he leaves you on the corner in front of the great spire of Nivix. Where do you go from here? Northwest. All right, cool. Somebody make me a survival check to see if you can find the set of blocks you're looking for. I've got a 18. 18 will be sufficient. You head north into where the city has been ruined by these gruel raiders. You see crushed buildings, smashed slate, stone, and brick as you wind your way through what used to be, you know, residential blocks. Mm. And you eventually get to the area you're looking for. Why don't you roll me one more survival check to see if you can find these legionnaires. Can I have had a short rest? We had a whole ass carriage ride. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you've definitely had time for a short rest. Okay. As I look about, all the buildings, all the great architecture, all the industry, just like the Undercity, it all returns to the Earth. And I roll a 14. As you make your way through this shattered landscape, you actually hear up ahead what sounds like raised voices. Do you hear that? Do I? The two of you can make perception checks. 18. Clark definitely hears it. 16. And Illipel does as well. On a dirty 20, can I hear what they're saying? Are you going to move towards them? Only if that won't get me any further context. From this far away, it's still a little muffled. You can just hear... But if you get closer, you might be able to make out words. Okay. Kind of ducking into whatever nearby shadows I can... All right, just stay behind me. Try not to make any noise. Make me a stealth check then. That's a 19. Very nice. Are the others of you trying to stay hidden as you approach this scene? suppose I should. All right, go ahead and roll me stealth as well then. Nope. Five. Five. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I, I bump into Illipel comically. One more fucking level until I can get past without trace for these fools. Okay, so the three of you, some more stealthily than others, make your way towards the sounds of this argument, and you do eventually begin to hear. Listen, you, I shall ask you one more time. Tell us where you have taken our friend, and we shall let you off with a warning. Look, I'll give you a warning. You tell me where you took my boy, or I'm a club ya. And you see in the distance a group of three Boros legionnaires, two humans and a goblin in a tense face-off with what looks like an ogre covered in these red chalky war paint markings and accompanied by a pair of goblins. What do you do as you approach this scene? Anything? Does it look like they've noticed us? That's a good question. Okay, the sergeant, or the person who looks like he's in command of this little Boros company here, does notice you and Illipel on approach, and will sort of make gesture to you to stay back. And the ogre actually will make a remark. How are you? What are you all doing here? You know what happened to my boy? You hiding in the hidey spot? Why don't you come out then? It appears we've been had. Can I see if I have or not? The ogre is the one pointing directly at you. He rolled a natural 20. Oh, on his fuck right check. off. <laughs> fuck right off. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> it appears we've been had. I suggest that we make the most of the situation and help our friends de-escalate in whatever means that may be. 
I have a running suspicion that we may have most serendipitously encountered the people we came for. What fortune that we may be able to help them. You really like to talk a lot. Why don't you put that to work on them instead of talking to us about it? Yeah. Go de-escalate that. Together then? And then I'll start walking and hope that they fucking follow me. I let Illipel lead and I stay maybe 15 feet behind. As you get closer, the sergeant will call out again to you. Stay back, citizen. This may become dangerous. Oh my god, I fucking hate these guys already. (laughs) It doesn't necessarily have to become dangerous. That being said, we're here at your aid, should you require it. Oh. I don't think that was the right fucking thing to say. (laughs) Oh, you want to get bopped too? Now. Or do you know where my boy went? Now, I don't know of any such boy, but I also don't know that I'm keen to receive a bop. What exactly are you looking for? What what, what happened to your boy? Do you know? Oh, he went missing. We think these goons here must have taken him to the lockup. We did no such thing, you brute. I think a viable option here is to have these lovely goons escort you to the lockup. See exactly what's there. We go to lockup, we's not coming back. That's not an option. Well, how about this? I'll strike you a deal. We all go to the lockup. You keep your weapons. If everything is above board, we walk away. With not a single scratch on us and not a single scratch on you. But if you get a stinking suspicion that anything is awry or your friend is in fact locked up as you suspect, then the bopping can commence. <laughs> as Elapel is speaking, can I make an insight on the Boros guys? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. That's only a 12. Let's see. These guys aren't hard to crack. They are sure. very forthright, and they do say, sort of confused, we made no arrests this morning, brute. They seem to be honest when they don't know what's going on. Okay. At the mention of bopping, can I do an insight check on the ogre? Yeah, go ahead. 14. Again, both parties not very subtle. Both of them believe that they are missing someone, and they can't find where this person is. And they both believe that the other has done it, and have no idea what the other is talking about. I just look towards Illipel. They've clearly been had by someone else. I thought the exact same. Pretty dangerous out here. People could get bopped. Listen, I think, for whatever it's worth, that each of you two in your respective parties have come to some similar conclusions. I think we can all agree that we are kind of in the same situation. Same, but different. Yeah? I think it might be best that as we explore the possibility that we're all not too different in this current predicament we find ourselves in, that perhaps we may benefit from one another, right? People are missing, are they not? All of the assembled groups sort of nod in affirmation. And when things go missing, what helps find them? Yes, a good set of eyes. And it seems to me that the more of those we have, the more quickly we will resolve our issues. No need for bumping, no need for... Throwing any rabble in jail. Simple resolution. Clean. Easy. Doesn't that sound quite marvelously attractive? Roll some fucking persuasion here. I'm trying to think if there's any way if there's any way I can aid. You don't need to, it's a nat twenty. <laughs> with oh a, with a seven mod, so twenty seven. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. There it is. Illapel. The legionnaires loosen their grip on their long swords and lower them to their side. The ogre scratches his head for a moment but seems appeased, as do the two goblins flanking him. He looks down and says, Right, so you's gonna find my boy? I think that'd be best. Yes, if you can find Martin, our missing comrade in arms, we should be most grateful. Where have each of you looked so far? Sort of simultaneously and comically, the Boros point at the Gruel and the Gruel point at the Boros. Ah. They's the first ones we found. Well, that's great news. That means we have the rest of the precinct to look at. Plenty of opportunity to find our missing friends and compatriots. How about this? Let us split up. Take the parts we all know best. You, pointing to the Legionnaires, continue on your patrol. An area you're most familiar with. And you... Pointing to the ogre. Well, take your pick. This district is yours. You know it better than anyone. We will collect and discuss what we know, and then revisit areas of interest as a full party. Agreeable? That a lot of words. 
But, uh, they sound nice. Okay. Yes, we shall follow this course of action, good master. The name is Illabel. No need for master. I'm Sergeant Zoltan. Thank you for coming to our assistance. A pleasure, sir. Delicately shakes his hand. He grabs your arm, Roman legionnaire style, and wags it forcefully. Illipel matches the, the shake. The conflict disperses. What shall you do from here? Clark is going to follow the legionnaires. Likewise. I'll follow behind, keeping an eye all around, but also behind us to see if anybody's following or skulking about. All right. You fall in line with these legionnaires. Glad that's over with. The goblin, Zep, turns to you and says, Yeah, I was getting kind of worried. You know, I've never I've never had to tussle with an ogre before. Oh, you never fought an ogre before? <laughs> she sort of looks into the ground. You know, I've, I've trained to do it, but there's always a difference between when you're hitting a sandbag in the yard and, and when you're actually fighting something real. Yeah, tell me about it. It's a living. So you're Zep? Yeah, I'm Zep. That's Zoltan, and the quiet one's Vinnick. And Vinnick, they look at you and grunt. Mm. So you fellas were in the office of the guild pack last night, I understand? Yeah, we was. You ain't gotta rub it in. Wait, how you know about that? We're here on official duty. Got some questions for you. Roll me persuasion. 23. Very well. I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. Zoltan, I presume. You presume correctly, good citizen. All right. Clerk's gonna take out a... I'm just gonna say notepad. You'd have, you'd have a little, little field notes book. Yeah. So why don't you first tell me why you got reassigned? Well, the sun went missing from the lab, and we were the ones guarding it. We obviously did not do an adequate job at our assignment, so we have been sent here as punishment. Not even a full night's rest. I'll say. So, uh, how did it happen? What were you doing? How did it get past all four of you? Well... It's something of a circular corridor around the labs. We were each patrolling different parts of it, checking in on each of the chambers. I was on the opposite side of the building when it happened. It was Zep who found Martin unconscious. Yeah, I was walking around the outer ring, right where all the labs are, and I stepped by and, and Martin was watching the sun's lab, and well, when I found him, he was just laying on the ground and the sun was gone. Did he have any injuries? Not really. He was just out cold. Hmm. No bumps and bruises, no scorch marks, nothing. Nothing like that at all. Real clean. Hmm. Where's he now? We don't know. We thought them gruel raiders took him. You know, it's not like we're super welcome out here, trying to restore order and whatnot, and they want to keep things just a pile of rocks, but we don't know where he is now. How long has he been missing? Maybe a half hour ago this happened. That's the funny thing, you know? We were doing our route. He said he had to check on something. He went over a hill, and we went to follow him after a minute or two, because he didn't come back. We don't know what happened. All right. Did he tell you anything about last night? It's kind of embarrassing for all of us. Him, most of all. He didn't really want to talk about it. All right. We really do need to find this guy. Take us to where he disappeared. As you wish. Do follow me. And he turns back around to the north. Were we even remotely going in the same direction? No, you weren't. You were moving away from it. This was like later on their patrol route. Yeah, I thought so. You head up to the north for a while, and and eventually you come to the sort of rise that he disappeared over. All right. I'm going to look at it. Going to do some survival to try and pick up the trail? Sounds good. Not amazing. That's only a 16. Still pretty good for finding a trail this fresh. You can see where some armored boots have tromped in the dirt. The footfalls are fairly heavy. You follow this trail until you see in the distance smoke rising from a small fire. Up there. No one saw that the first time. No, that is something of a new development, good master. Green Wolf. I look to the legionnaires as if to say, lead the way. I think you lot might be better suited to investigate this. Gotta do everything myself. All right. Fuck, fucking cat. Clark just walks over to the fire. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. Right, yeah. You walk towards the fire. It's a ways off, but these guys, they aren't following you. I mean, would an insight check tell me that they're just being cowardly, or is this like they don't they don't want to even deal with their own problem? Yeah, you can roll insight on that. That's a 21. The way Zoltan talks, he's not a coward, but you think he might know something more about what's going on here than he's letting on. I kept my mouth shut this long. What is it you're not telling us? Roll persuasion. 
or intimidation would also be acceptable by your tone. That's a 12. A flat 12. Look, there's nothing else I can tell you. And there it is. Can tell us. Precisely, my friend. Well said. Zoltan, is it that you can't, won't, simply do not want to? I get the sneaking suspicion that in spite of all of our due diligence and best efforts to aid you against those brutish gruel earlier, that you have not been quite as forthcoming as you otherwise could be. I think it might warrant a reintroduction. Perhaps we let it slip earlier, and for that my sincerest apologies, but it is worth mentioning again that we are here on behalf of the Guild Pact, specifically under orders from Ral, Guild Master of the Izzet League. Rolpers? And uh, I'm not done, not done yet. <laughs> Of course they're not. <laughs> and while I do respect that your legion has quite a bit of work cut out for it to recurry favor amongst Boros, I do respect that. One has to wonder what kind of ill tidings would present to get in the way of orders directly from the Guild Pact. And see, I have my theories as to what that fire up ahead is. And I have my theories as to what transpired the other night in the lab. But they are only theories. Probably incorrect. I'm not too smart an individual. And if those theories were to spin uncontrollably, threaded out in chaos, back to the Guild Pact, I do not suspect that your recurring a favor to Boros would go quite as smoothly or as quickly as you would like. Roll intimidation. Just 20. Holy crap. Zoltan looks at you stone-faced. Fuck this guy. People talk too much. And that couldn't have been persuasion, huh? No, you were threatening him. You were threatening him with blackmail. You can see him, your words digging into him. But he just shakes his head and puts his hand on his sword. There's nothing else I can tell you, citizen. This is all humanoid nonsense. Zep knows what I'm talking about. Let's just go look at the fire. As I turn around to follow Clark, I just say back to Zoltan, You brought dishonor to yourself and your guilt. And I spit on the ground and I follow Clark. Love it. That's great. <laughs> you head towards the smoke rising from this fire. It's a bit of a walk, but as you get closer, you can sort of see some makeshift barricades and tents set up. Uh, what do you do? I'm going to look past over Clark and make a perception check. That's a 22. Yeah, so you notice something interesting about these barricades and these tents. Some of the materials they're made of seem to come from different places. You can see some elements of crust structure and bone that would sort of be indicative of gruel construction, but you can also see sturdy palisades and the red and gold cloth tents that are more professional legion material. You can see elements of both in this campsite. Can I, like, follow that up with any sort of, like, insight or or anything else to... Absolutely, insight is fine. That's a 16. It's a little odd to see these things together, but you heard, perhaps, of mixed units that ended up fighting together during the invasion that may have stayed in contact afterward, may have shared resources, things like that. I look down at Clark. Well, what'd you learn? I look back up. Is anyone there? Show yourselves. We come in peace. There's actually a sentinel standing outside a minotaur, and she looks at you. You come in peace? Who are you? I look down to Clark. None of your business. <sighs> I move past Clark after he says that. <laughs> We're with the officer of the guild pact. We come on official business. We're looking for two missing people. A legionnaire. A member of the clans. Do you know who of which we speak? You'll find plenty of those here, but if you're here on official business, this is something of an unofficial outfit. I'd like to keep it covert, if you don't mind. I'm Zytha, and these are my irregulars. Mm, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Can I roll, like, history or insight or something on that? Sure. Insight, probably. That's, a uh, 15. Probably can't get any more information than this is one of those mixed units you heard of before. We're not looking for any trouble. We just want to make sure no one's being kept here against their will. Roll me a persuasion check. With no mod, that is a 19. You love to see it. Zytha takes you at your word. No, no one is here against their will. We're all fighters, us, but we all felt kind of that we were missing something worth fighting for. The invasion gave us that, and so we've stuck together ever since. 
trying to keep pointing our weapons at things that matter. And as you get closer, you see that she has Boros armor pieces on her, but it's all painted over with this tribal, gruel mm. war paint. Her mm -hmm. weapons are similarly mismatched, but she ushers you into this sort of makeshift camp. You see, as you walk into this massive tents, there's a fire burning in the middle. People seem to be getting ready for battle. They're strapping on pieces of armor, sharpening weapons, anointing themselves with war paint, going through their various bags, making sure all their spell components are in order. I turn to her and say, And what is it you plan on putting your weapons at today? I'm glad you've asked. There's some racketeers about to shake down an innocent shopkeep. Their business was pretty much run under in all the chaos, but their debts weren't cancelled. No extenuating circumstances clause, so... We're off to make sure that, you know, they have a fighting chance to keep what's theirs. They've never done anybody wrong. Do you know someone by the name of Martin? Hey, Martin! Martin! A young human legionnaire steps out from within a tent. You can see he's still wearing all of his legion armor, but he's sort of haphazardly slapped some war paint on his face. Yeah, Zytha? What do you need? Martin! These guys are looking for you. You're Martin? Yeah, I'm Martin. Well, what can I do for you? We're about to go into battle. Well, you've had an interesting couple of days, haven't you? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Why are you out here looking for me? You're not gonna... You're not gonna report me, are you? No, 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 no. No such thing. We are quite interested in those days that we speak of, though. Martin looks at the ground. Between this and the screw-up back at the chamber, I'm probably gonna lose my commission. Why should I talk to you about it? Well... You served the Boros Legion faithfully for quite a while. I'd imagine that there's at least some part of you that believes in something. And believes in doing the right thing. But if I'm wrong and that's not the case, which is perfectly acceptable, perhaps you'd like to earn that commission back. And what better way to do it than in service of three agents of the Guild Pact? And I would imagine any egregious faults you may have displayed on behalf of Boros in the last few days shall be swiftly forgiven upon our recommendation. But, and I hope you agree that this is more than fair, that recommendation has to be earned with information. You talk a lot. How do I know you believe in doing the right thing? Well, the truth of the matter, Martin, is that I do believe in doing the right thing. For me. And right now, the right thing for me happens to be the right thing for you. How serendipitous is that? I don't step in front of Illipel, but I do put by positioning between them and Martin, and I say, Look, they may talk a lot, use their words to try and convince you, but I can see, standing here, all these people, you're already fighting for what you believe in, and we want no part in undoing that. We just want answers, and then we'll be on our way. I guess all I care about now is doing what little good I can. If you'd come with us, show me that you, you'll put yourselves on the line to fight for what's right, and I'll happily tell you, but I'm, I'm going. I look back to Illipel. Do I get a, a notion from them that they would be willing to do this? Illipel nods in your direction. I'll look over the other side of my shoulder to Clork. Gotta do what you gotta do. Then I look back to Martin. I take my mallet in one hand and hold it up, and it bursts into this aura of dark spores and energy. All right, we're done talking. Let's fight. Martin looks at you with some respect. We stop this shakedown. I'll let you know everything. And after having this conversation, Zytha turns around to those assembled. All right, the regulars, we're moving out. Time to find out how good a party we really are. And she begins leading the company off to the west through this wasteland of shattered buildings. And that's where we'll conclude the first session. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato, that's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our holy Avengers, Jake, May, and Chris. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.